song of the broken hearted Sincere prayer with faith and pardon I'm gonna step out from the world and crowd You're gonna hear my praise and shout it out loud Here is my
are bad within that type of relationship. And so basically, again, we're just taking a stand on these issues and we're making a public statement on how we, uh, you know, stand as a church there. And then abortion and uh, discrimination of topics we may have in uh, upcoming weeks. But this is just basically a list of controversial social issues um, that um, basically we found by polling on the internet. So traditional marriage upsets is where we were last week. And the title of that sermon was called uh, The Latest Fad. Fad being fornication, adultery, and divorce. F-A-D. So just to play on words there, but uh, uh, basically what we found in by studying the scriptures is that fornication, of course, is sin. Adultery is also sin. And divorce, though we found divorce, there's not really a scripture that says don't do that, it's not a sin. However, God hates it and it can lead to sin in the spouse. And the scripture, Jesus said, you know, only do it, the only reason you would do it is for fornication, or that's the only cause. But looking at that closer, what he's saying there when he's talking about that Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of people's hearts, basically, the position that the Bible encourages us to towards is never, never divorce unless it would cause you to lose your relationship with God. The hardness of the heart is that loss of relationship with God. So that's why God allows it. So technically not a sin, but not something we're supposed to do. And these are traditional marriage upsets. So last week we kind of defined what they were. You know, the Bible uses different words in the original Greek or uh, Hebrew for fornication and adultery. It's particularly those differences can be seen if you look at the Old Testament, but, but the the modern translations of the Bible kind of blur those distinctions. Sometimes they translate both words as the same thing, or they lump them together and they, sex, they say sexual sins or sexual immoralities. So, so basically we define those terms and we, we highlighted the, the specific meanings in Scripture. Um, and so this week we're going to look at more of how they touch marriage and Basically, um, what does the Bible say and how we should live to avoid those marriage upsets? Um, so we're just looking at Scripture and uh, we're not relying on our own understanding here. We're trying to seek out what does the Bible say on these topics. So, the first thing that the Scripture says when we're talking about marriage, we want to have a good, solid marriage, is choose wisely. Choose wisely. The people who get married have to understand that divorce is real. If you just look at the statistics, and it depends on what, what source you look at, it's very plain to see that divorce is going to affect a lot of people and a majority of people in the country. It's, it's something that is real. And when people are in love, they say, oh, it can't happen to me. But we have to accept that it can happen to us. That's particularly true uh, for, for young people, but even, even as, as we get older, even if it's a second or a third marriage that we happen to be in, sometimes we say, oh, I've, I've been down this block before, and, and we, can, we can blind ourselves to the reality of it. It's a real thing, and it can happen to us person who is getting married, particularly for the first time, needs to decide consciously that it takes more than just physical attraction to make marriage work. It's hard work to keep in relationship. And we have to assign value to godly principles. So God states that it's going to, you know, marriage is should have these certain principles associated with it and we may decide you know this it doesn't really work that way but we need to in our minds understand that God made us and he knows how we work and he knows the things that we need to do to live the correct way inside the context of marriage so for young people especially respecting counsel from godly parents I know when uh, when I was choosing a mate, I, I got some input from family members and 
and from parents. And we have to respect that. We have to be respectful to our parents. Honor your father and mother, of course. And then the Bible has certain criteria for a good spouse. And sometimes when we are in love and we, we found someone and they excite us, we, we can be like horses with blinders on. We can only see what's right in front of us and not see dangers that are around us. So choosing wisely. We're going to look at some scriptures here that talk about this. Just a few scriptures. And this, uh, we'll start out with, this is the advice for men. So if you're a young man watching by video, pay close attention. If you're getting ready to get married or if you're looking, pay careful attention. This is advice for men. Proverbs chapter 6, we'll look at uh, most of 20 to 26, and this is out of the New Living Translation. It says, My son, obey your father's commandments, and don't neglect your mother's instruction. Keep their words always in your heart. Their corrective discipline is the way to life. Young men, when your father and your mother are giving you input, if they are godly parents, pay close attention to them. Do not do so can cause you great disturbance later and regrets later. You may think, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm in love. But we're not listening specifically to their words and their human words, but God speaks through our parents. Verse 24, It will keep you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of a promiscuous woman. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coy glances seduce you, for prostitute will bring you to poverty. When we meet someone, we don't really know what's in their heart. Particularly when we're dating, particularly when we're going places, doing some fun stuff together, that's not the real person. The real person sometimes we don't see until after we're married. And if we choose someone who doesn't have the values in their heart that are godly values, Hear the word prostitutes used, but whatever, whatever word you might use to talk about this person, this woman who doesn't have God's mind in their heart, who doesn't follow after the things of God, Scripture says they'll bring you to poverty. Now trust me, five years down the road, when you're working hard for every dollar and you see an unfit wife taking your dollars and doing ungodly things with them, it'll make you think twice. Proverbs chapter 30, 10 through 31, is a very well-known verse. It talks about uh, a, a woman of great value. Here in this translation, we're in common English Bible, it says a competent wife. A competent wife does, how does one find her? How does Scripture say that we're supposed to examine someone to decide, is this a person that I'm supposed to marry? How does one find her? Well, let's see what the Bible has to say on it. Because her value is far above pearls, it says. Her husband entrusts his heart to her. And with her, he will have all he needs. She brings him good and not trouble all the days of her life. And there's a lot of things that the Bible here talks about. I'm going to sum them up because this is a lot of verses to read on it. Uh, for this passage. But basically, is she trustworthy and dependable? Is she industrious and productive, working with her hands, laboring? It may not seem very important to you now, but down the road, if you're the only one working, and you're working very hard to bring home an income, and your wife is not a worker, and basically you're the producer and she's the consumer, after years and years, this is going to tax on you. Is she industrious and productive? Does she work harder and smarter? The scripture there talks about is she, you know, staying up late to make sure that the kids have what they need. When you have children of your own and you see them going without, and you see their needs not being met, even though you're working 110% and still they're not taken care of, your heart will sink. So scripture says, look for someone who's Thoughtful and charitable? Is she looking out for others? Is she giving to others? And using wisdom and teaching others? And probably more important than all, does she have good reputation? Because that's going to bring honor to you. If she doesn't, it's going to bring you down. You might think, oh, but I'm in love. But if these things 
you don't see in the person that you're with, Scripture says, be cautious, be careful. Are you with the wrong kind of person? At the end of that verse section, the verses there in 30 and 31, charm is deceptive and beauty fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let her share in the results of her work and let her deeds praise her in her gates. Who can find a virtuous woman? So that was advice for men. Now let's look at what the Scripture has to say. What's the advice for women? Well, there's not kind of the same verse as that, that virtuous woman section in Proverbs. There's not really the same positive outlook on men in Scripture. But for women, there is a, a verse here. Let's look at it. It's in Proverbs 24. I'm going to read this from the complete Jewish Bible. Chapter 24, verses 30 to 34. It says, I passed by the field of a lazy man and the vineyard of a man lacking sense. There it was, overgrown with thistles, and the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. I looked, and I thought about it. I saw, and I learned this lesson. Let's just lie here a bit, a little longer. I'll just fold my hands and get a little more sleep. And poverty comes marching on you. Scarcity hits you like an invading soldier. What's Scripture's warning to us, to the ladies? The ladies want a man who's going to provide for her and her family. Times are going to be tough in the beginning, but a man who works hard will work and work to provide. And eventually you build up to a point to where you have some comfort and you want to have some enjoyment in life. But what's Scripture say? You find a young man, he excites you, but is he working? Is he industrious? Is he working hard to provide? Or does he just like to have fun all the time? Be honest with yourself because if you marry, this is the person you're going to be with forever. Where are you going to be in five years? Where are you going to be in ten years? Are you going to have that house with the white picket fence? The lawn that's mowed and looks pretty and you're, you're happy to invite people over to your home? Or are you going to live in a shanty, broken down shack, weeds all grown up? It all depends on the guy that you pick. Is he... Is he lazy or is he a man after God's own heart? Wise and a hard worker. That's the advice for women. Be careful in who you pick. Now, I'm speaking a lot from experience, sometimes not my own. I'm kind of a bit of a people watcher. And I have the benefit of being the youngest child in a large family. And so, in some cases, I, I look back on my life and I remember... Some of the mistakes that my family members made, my brothers, my sister, and we're all going to make mistakes. But it's important that we learn from the mistakes. Learn from other people's mistakes as well. That's wise. That's using wisdom. And if we are in fear of the Lord, and if we want to follow His work, then, then we'll apply those things to our hearts. So, in the fornication, adultery, and divorce situation, the FAD that we talked about last night, or last time, why is fornication an upset to marriage? That was a question that kind of came up. And so I want to touch on that before we leave this section. If you're having sex before marriage, and again, I'm speaking to the young people who's watching by video, if you're having sex before marriage, understand that it is nearly impossible to use wisdom to choose your mate. You're going to be blinded. You're only thinking about the, the excitement and the fun that you're having right now. And especially if you're having sex before marriage, you're blind in your situation. If you want to use wisdom, if you want to follow God's principles, you have to be completely objective and unbiased. You have to look at the person for how they're treating you, not just, not just how they excite you. Because it's those effects years down the road when you're married and you have kids or you're working hard and you're paying the bills and you're trying to buy a home and that's when it really comes out. So having sex before marriage, it's an upset to marriage for one reason because you can end up choosing the wrong person simply because you're blinded and not using wisdom. 
But another thing that the Scripture says is you are training yourself and your potential marriage partner that excitement can be found in forbidden pleasure. Let's see what the verses are for that. It's Proverbs chapter 9, 17 to 18. Talking about a man being enticed by a woman here, but it can apply in both situations, to both sides, to both the men and women. Stolen water is sweeter, and food eaten in secret tastes better. But these people don't know that everyone who goes there dies. When you're having sex before marriage, you have to sneak around parents, you have to find hidden places to go, you have to park in places you hope the cops won't find you, and so on. And it's all exciting because you're getting away with it for a little while. You're, you're sneaking past the authorities. You're pulling the wool over your parents' eyes. And it's secretive. And it's fun and exciting. And the Scripture agrees. It can be. But use wisdom and think about years later when the marriage comes... Now, you're no longer getting around behind people's backs. It's now open. You had a wedding and you invited everyone to come see. It's not going to be as fun if you think about it. But down the road, when you and your spouse are going through the hard times and the difficult times together, what's the tendency going to be? You think back to those times when you had fun and now instead of sneaking around your parents, you find that sneaking around your spouse is, gives you that same thrill and excitement. The Word of God warns us against that. Don't have sex before marriage. If you are a virgin, if you have not been married, and you're, you're, come, you're, you're dating someone, you're engaged to someone now, listen to God. Listen to Scripture. Keep yourself on the straight path. Save yourself for your spouse after you're married. That's God's Word. Choosing wisely. Understand that divorce is real and accept that it can happen to us. When we begin to use wisdom and God's Word and we apply those principles, understanding that it's divorce is real and accepting that it can apply to us gives us wisdom, gives us reason to use caution and to make good decisions and godly decisions. Decide that it takes more than physical attraction to make marriage work. Believe God's Word that it's important to find someone who doesn't just excite you and, oh, they're so beautiful and or so handsome. But look into their heart. How are they going to treat you? It's going to become important to you. And assign value to God's principles. You have to make a decision ahead of time because if you're trying to make a decision and you're already caught up in the moment and the excitement, that's going to seem the most important to you. So decide ahead of time that God's Word and what He says is important. Choose wisely. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about the upsets to marriage. The second point we're going to go into is called rendering due benevolence. Render due benevolence. Understand that adultery is real. Adultery, as we said last time, is when a married couple, one or one person in a married couple, has sex with someone else other than their partner. Understand that it is real. And when you're married and you're in love and you think, oh, we're just so in love with each other, nothing could ever happen to us. This is we're to tight, we're together, we're always going to be together. Statistics say that about 50% of people who are married will end up being divorced. That's one in two. If you can think of two friends that you have, a co-worker, someone you know in church, if one in two is going to go through divorce, think about two of your friends. Odds are at least one of them will see divorce in their lifetime. Understand that it is real. And accept that it can happen to us. We think, oh, but I'm so in love and we love each other and we're so committed to each other. We have to accept that it can happen to us. Temptations are real and we have to be prepared for them. 
Now this is scriptural. Decide that sexual intercourse and intimacy are important to make a marriage work. It's important in a marriage. Now there's the reason there's an and in the middle is because a marriage is made up of two sides. The guys tend to gravitate towards one and the ladies tend to gravitate towards the other. But sex in marriage and intimacy is both important. It's important to make marriage work. And we have to, again, assign value to God's principles. Now in doing that, we're going to see that what we need to do is respect counsel from the apostles. When we turn into God's Word, the apostles tell us about sex and marriage, relationships, and we need to respect what they say. We need to respect it. It's part of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is the chapter that is, has the largest amount of information. So we're going to read verses 1 through 6 here, and I'm going to read this from the King James Version. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incumbency. In King James, that's very poetic sounding, but you end up at the end of the verse you're going, now what did I just read? Uh, so we're going to look at these verses one at a time, and I'm going to actually start with number 6. Actually, we didn't read verse 6. Verse 6 says, But I speak by permission and not of commandment. Let's look at verse 6 and work our way backwards here. Verse 6 in the King James says, I speak this by permission and not by commandment. Now let's look, I'm going to read from a few other uh, translations in Scripture, and I think that will help us to understand and give us the meaning. This is a pretty good exercise to do when you're studying Scripture. The AMP, that stands for the Amplified Translation. And that's pretty good because when some meanings are in question, they'll, they'll, a questionable word or something, they'll put in parenthesis some additional information that helps convey the meaning that's being said there. So the same verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6, let's read it from the Amplified now. But I am saying this more as a matter of permission and concession, not as a command or regulation. This is the Apostle Paul speaking or writing to the church in Corinth, and he's speaking to them saying, not as a command or a regulation. Now this is in Scripture, this is God's Word, but he's saying not a command or a regulation. Let's, let's read it in the contemporary English version, CEV. In my opinion, this is what should be done, though I don't know of anything the Lord says on this matter. Now last week, I pointed out that one thing I like about Paul is, is when he writes, he says, when he says something, he says, now this came from God, this is from God, this is, I'm commanded to tell you about it. And then there's some other parts where Paul says, well now, this is what I think, this didn't come straight from God, but this is based on Godly principles. So I like that about Paul when he's, when he's teaching, oftentimes he'll put that in there. So what he's saying here is in this passage of Scripture, this is not God's command that this must happen. But he said this is based on godly principles. This is what I think should be done. This is the opinion of apostles that we need to have respect for when we're applying godly principles. So let's go back now. We're working our way backwards. Let's look at chapter at verse 5. In the King James we read, Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time. And so on. And uh, looking at the contemporary English version now, let's look at that. Sometimes these different translations make it very plain. It says, don't refuse sex to each other. 
unless you agree not to have sex for a little while in order to spend time in prayer. Then Satan won't be able to tempt you for your lack of self-control. Seems a little more clear than defraud you not one another. Basically, we're talking about a husband and a wife, a married couple. Don't refuse to have sex with each other unless you agree. And there's a time for that. In the King James, it says prayer and fasting. This is a time of devoted prayer. This is a time of... There are times when the church calls a fast and a prayer, and there's sometimes you need to do it on your own. And so, in those times, to say, honey, let's not do this right now, because I need to spend time with God. If both are in agreement, that's okay. But don't refuse. Let's look at one more translation. Uh, this is in the uh, New Life Version. New Life Version, NLV. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Do not keep from each other that which belongs to each other in marriage, unless you agree for a while so you can use your time to pray. Then come together again, or the devil will tempt you to do that which you know you should not do. What's the reason for coming back together? Because the temptations of Satan is there. The temptation to draw you out of the marriage relationship is there. So unless both parties agree, don't refuse each other. But if you agree, then agree to come back together because those temptations are there. All right, let's step backwards. One more verse. 1 Corinthians 7, 4. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Tell you what, uh, let's come back to this one in a minute. Let's come back to this one in a minute. Let's jump back to one more. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 30. The King James it says, "Let the husband render under under the unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband." Due benevolence. This is where the topic of our sermon today comes from. Let's read what it says in a different translation. This is the New American Standard Bible. Listen to what it says in that translation: The husband must fulfill his duty to the wife. And likewise also the wife to her husband. New American Standard is not a very recent translation. So you can kind of see how maybe the times influence the wording here. It's a duty that we have to each other. It kind of makes it sound, drag me down. You know, we don't like to do it if it's just a duty. I mean, we're supposed to do our duty, but sometimes we do duties reluctantly. Let's look at another translation. Look at the Amplified. The husband should give his wife her conjugal rights, goodwill, kindness, and what is due her as his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. That sounds a little bit different. You know, one thing that people forget sometimes is when we say I do, we're supposed to keep our word. We have these things called marriage vows. We honor, love, cherish. And sometimes we forget that we're making a commitment to one another. And there's, there's reasons for that commitment. That it's conjugal rights is what they say. Let's read one more verse. Contemporary English version. 1 Corinthians 7, 3. Husbands and wives should be fair with each other about having sex. Just to be fair. When you say I do, it's fair that you do the things that you say you'll do. And on the flip side, if you say I do, relationships are not give and give relationships, they are give and take. When you give into a marriage, it's expected that you receive benefit from that marriage. So that's what 1 Corinthians 7 3 is talking about is sex within marriage. It's a right, it's a privilege, and it's a duty, but it's something that should be fair. It's something that should be fair, because both people enter the marriage for different reasons. All right, let's step back one more verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. That's the King James Version. 
Let's read it now from the Amplified. But because of the temptation to impurity and to avoid immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Listen to what it's saying there. Because of the temptation to impurity and to avoid immorality, it's a temptation that's going to be out there that we're going to be tempted to go to people who we shouldn't go to, to have sex with strange women, as Scripture says, or, or to, to find a lazy man and have a relationship with him, or whatever the situation may be. It's a temptation both for men and for women. But when you break that down, it says, let each have his own wife, let each have his own husband. It's because of the temptation. He went back to verse 1. He says it's, it's good for us not to even have those relationships if we can avoid it. But the reason we do is to avoid temptation. Let's read one more. Contemporary English verse. I like the way it is. very plain, very blunt. Well, having your own husband or wife should keep you from doing something immoral. <laughs> I, it's just so plain spoken. I kind of like that when I was reading through that. The reason you have a husband or a wife is to keep yourself from doing something immoral. Otherwise, who knows what mischief you might get yourself into or trouble you might get yourself into. Um, we were talking this week about this movie called uh, Dude, Where's My Car? It's funny. A couple of years ago, it came out. And uh, the guy wakes up and he has no memory of the night before and he finds he's gotten himself into all this kind of trouble and he was doing here doing things and there doing things that he had no recollection of. And uh, so hopefully when you're married you don't have this experience because you're keeping things on the level. You're doing the right thing before God in marriage. The purpose of marriage is to avoid these immoralities. The purpose of marriage is do that. That's a, that's a bold statement the Scripture says. There's a lot of reasons to get married. Genesis, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. For what cause? According to Paul, the reason you get married is to have an exclusive relationship with one person so you're not tempted to go and be party to sexual sins. That is the reason marriage exists according to Scripture, according to Paul here. It's just a bold statement, something you don't think of. But that is the reason for marriage in the very first place. To render due benevolence. Understand that adultery is real. The temptations are there. The draw, the temptation to be pulled into sexual sins is there. And that's why we have marriage, is to not be pulled into those sexual situations. But even after you get married, temptation is still there. And therefore, adultery is a possibility. And don't ignorantly say it can't happen to me. Statistics say it can. And it likely will. So it takes work. Sexual intercourse and intimacy, the, the needs of the individual members of that couple, it's important to satisfy those in order to make marriage work. And men, intimacy is a part of that. Intimacy. But most importantly, is assign value to godly principles. Respect the counsel of the apostles. Now, I'm going to throw in one more here. Keep the marriage bed undefiled. If we're going to render due benevolence to our spouse, and we're going to fulfill our duty to her or to him, we should also fulfill our duty to God, which is to keep the marriage bed undefiled. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, the words bed and undefiled actually come from the King James. I'm going to read it from the New Century Version. I like this translation best. Marriage should be honored by everyone, and a husband and wife should keep their marriage pure. God will judge as guilty those who take part in sexual sins. They say anything that goes on in the bedroom with a couple is their own business. But man, both husband and wife should guard their bed and make sure that what they're doing is not sin. 
We shouldn't judge as people judging others. However, it's responsibility. And in fact, it'll, 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 it helps ensure the happiness if there's no sexual sin there. Keep the marriage bed pure. Okay, finally we're going to go to our last point. Respect spiritual authority. Respect spiritual authority. Understand God's design for marriage. Sometimes we walk in blind. We don't know what we're getting ourselves into. We say, I do, and then we wish we didn't. But understand God's design for marriage. And accept and live up to our assigned roles. God has a certain way marriage is supposed to take place and, and be carried on and conducted. And sometimes once we get in there, we realize, you mean I'm supposed to do that? We don't want to. We, we fight the bit. We, we resist. But understand God's plan and then accept and perform our roles. Decide that mutual respect and love are important to make a marriage work. It takes on both sides. Sometimes you get into uh, an argument and one person will say, well, you never respect me. And they fail to understand that they're supposed to show respect back. Respect is because of the spiritual authority. We'll look at that in a minute. Assign value to godly principles, just as in the other two cases. Let's put God's Word first. Sometimes it says things we don't like, but follow God's steps. Do everything as unto the Lord. Remember, when we're in a marriage, there's a level, there's certain accountabilities, but one thing to always keep in mind is we are accountable to God for what we do in a marriage. So when we do our duties, when we do the things that we do, do it as anything, any service that we perform for God, let's do it to our best. Conduct marriage, conduct in marriage affects spiritual life. The last thing to keep in mind, whatever we do, the choices that we make is going to affect our relationship with God. We have a relationship with a spouse that mirrors our relationship with God. And when one breaks down, the other is going to break down. So our conduct really impacts our spiritual life. So look at the first verse here, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read 22, 25, and 28. And this is out of Good News Translation, GNT. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband has authority over his wife, just as Christ has authority over the church. And Christ is himself the Savior of the church, his body. And so wives must submit themselves completely to their husbands, just as as the church submits itself to Christ. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave His life for it. Men ought to love their wives just as they love their own bodies. A man who loves him, his wife loves himself. God's plan for marriage includes this little ordinance that we, that we call submission. When those marriage vows are spoken, you know, oh, I, I, I vow to love and honor and cherish. And it's a funny thing when uh, the husband's writing the vows, they, they'll put obey. And the wife sometimes will take offense to that. And I don't want to take that one out. Some people watching may, uh, may be able to relate to that. But we have to understand that when we are committing into a godly marriage, God's order of things is to put... Uh, an authority and a hierarchy in place here. Just as Christ is the head of the church. And I don't think anybody here would argue that Christ is in charge of the church. Are we going to rise up above Christ and try and take control of things? Well, I hope not. I hope we always understand that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. If you are going to a church and Jesus Christ is not the head of it, I encourage you to think again. Find a place where they lift God at the highest and Christ is sovereign over the church. So in the same way, in a marriage, the man is placed in a position of authority over the wife. 
Some wives don't like that, and they resist that. But this is God's structure for the marriage. But it's not just a one-sided thing. The husband is supposed to love the wife as his own body. Think about what Jesus did for the church. He took nails into his hands, and he hung on a cross, and he put up with their shouting at him, and them, they're mocking him, telling him he should come down off that cross. You're not who you say you are, because you're hanging there, and you, you have no power. And they, they mocked him, they scourged him, they put the crown of thorns on his head, they beat him, they whipped him. He wasn't even recognizable, and he endured that and took that because of the love. Marriages sometimes can be very taxing. There can be a lot of stress and a lot of things. Men, men have to take that. Men have to receive the blows when it's necessary. That's the love. So it's hard to be in charge. It's hard to be the one that's got to make the final decision in matters of family. It's hard to be the one that has that responsibility. It takes an equal amount of effort for a guy to take that position of authority just as much as it is for the wife to take the position of being the submissive one. That's his God plan. 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 and 2 and 6 and 7. I'll read this from the uh, New Life verse. Wives, obey your husbands. Some of your husbands may not obey the word of God. So, before I go on, what, what we're talking about here is a, is a Christian woman married to an unchristian man. Or, maybe a man who's been a Christian, but he's backslidden. He's not following God's Word. This is, what, situ, what is the situation that we have to deal with here? It doesn't matter. God has still placed the man in authority in, a, in the marriage. and So, Peter here is writing and he's saying, Wives, obey your own husbands. Some of your husbands may not obey the Word of God. Well that, well, that sounds crazy. You know, why would God tell us to obey someone who's not even a Christian? It's that authority. It still applies. Let's read on. By obeying your husbands, they may become Christians by the life you live without saying anything. They will see how your love, how you love God and how your lives are pure. Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham. She respected him as the head of the house. You are her children if you do what is right and do not have fear. In the same way, husbands should understand and respect their wives because women are weaker than men. Remember, if both husband and wife are to share together the gift that lasts forever, if this is not done, you will find it hard to pray. You might have reasons for saying, Oh no, I don't want to do that. I I I, I won't take second I won't play second fiddle. I won't take second seat. I won't sit in the passenger seat. I wear the pants in the family. Ladies, God has placed the men in authority. What if they don't act like they're in authority? What if they're not living up to that role? We still have our responsibility. The women still should be obedient to their husbands. If they're not dis if they're not committing outright sin, if they're not engaged in a criminal act, for example, something like that, if there's no sin going on, specifically sin, we're supposed to obey. If this is not done, you'll find it hard to pray. Remember, what we do in our marriage affects our spiritual walk with God. Let's get back. We've been kind of hard on the ladies in the last couple of minutes. Let's get back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. Remember, this is one we said we'd come back to later. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. Likewise also, the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Let's look to see what this says. Now, we're going to look at this in a couple of translations. Everybody hang on. Let's read it from the New Life version. The wife is not the boss of her own body. It belongs to the husband. So ladies, just as in obedience, just as in being submissive to the husband, this is part of it. The wife is not the boss of her own body, it belongs to the husband. Listen to the rest. And in the same way, the husband is not the boss of his own body, it belongs to the wife. Ah, that's 
little bit different than hath not power. It's, it's a little more to the point. Let's look at another one. Let's read from the Amplified. For the wife does not have exclusive authority and control over her own body, but the husband has his rights. Remember, it's a marriage. It's a vow. We say, I do. Each side has his rights. Likewise, also the husband does not have exclusive authority and control over his own body, but the wife. I see the men beginning to shake in their boots here. Let's read one more translation. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. Let's read from the NASB, New American Standard. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Talking about authority structures here, and in the marriage construct, God has placed the man to have an authority over the family, and the wife is in submission. There is one exception to that rule. The man is the spiritual authority over his wife, but the wife is a spiritual authority over the husband. Now let's see, we're going to just give a couple of examples here of what this means. The man might say, honey, let's, let's get wild tonight. Let's do, let's do something wild. Let's have some fun. Ladies, Wife says, oh, honey, I have an edit tonight. This is a classic example, right? Well, for the man, that might seem to be a challenge of authority. But remember, the man's supposed to love the wife. So if this happens, men, take a back seat. Take a cold shower. Take care of your wife if she has need. Now, if this happens again and again and again and again, the scripture would kick in and says, defraud ye not one another. Be fair to one another. Be fair to one another. Really, honey, how, how bad is are there are your headaches? You know? I mean, are these headaches really happening or is this becoming an excuse? So the man has some authority to in situations like that to compel his wife. Now, we have to respect, but we have to be fair. But now on the flip side, here's where the authority that the wife has over the man. And, and I say this because men kind of have their own kinky ideas about things that should go on. Now, honey, let's, I've got this video here that I just happened to pick up uh, on my way home from work. Let's watch it, uh, you know, for, for some foreplay or something. Well, the wife is a spiritual authority over the man. Guess what? She gets to say no. No, you may not watch that. Oh, but honey, let's we're we're out here in the beautiful woods walking around. Let's let's do some something wild out here in the woods. And the wife might say, "No." Guess what, guys? The wife is a spiritual authority over you. And the answer is no. Spiritual authority can be a good thing, but spiritual authority can also be something that, uh, that might, uh, might not be pleasing once in a while. But remember, this is God's plan. This is God's structure for marriage. You have the final say in most things in the marriage. You, you have make the final decision. The wife is submissive to the husband. But on one matter, gentlemen, on one matter, men, the, men, the women are your spiritual authority. If you're going to have a good relationship with God, you have to respect that authority. In, in matters of sex and the bed, your actions are dictated by the woman. Remember that, men. Let that sink in. The wife is the spiritual authority of the husband. Whoa. You don't hear that preached too often. So women... Be submissive. But gentlemen, remember who your spiritual authority is and respect that authority. Respect spiritual authority applies to both sides. Understand it's God's design for marriage. 
We have to accept and live up to our assigned roles. Yes, men, this applies to you as well. Decide that mutual respect and love are important to make marriage work. It's a mutual respect. We have to have respect for one another. When someone else says no, or someone else compels us to do something, or to not do something, if they are our spiritual authority, we have to have respect for that. Respect for people's feelings, respect for their well-being, be concerned about one another, and love. It has to be mutual. It has to work both ways for marriage to work. But most importantly, give assign value in your heart to the godly principles regarding marriage. Do everything as unto the Lord. Because our conduct in marriage affects our spiritual life. Remember. Where has benevolence gone? So many divorces in this country. It's really, it's really getting to be where most people understand and have direct contact with, with divorce because divorce rates are so high. There's just so many people. It's, if it's not happened in your family, it's probably happened in the family of a friend or relative that's very close to you. You know, where, where, is, where is love and compassion and respect gone in our country? The word malevolence literally means disposition to do good, an act of kindness, or a generous gift. Merriam-Webster. I chose that for the title of the sermon today because it says it in the King James and it's referring to sex within marriage. But remember, we're talking about doing good to one another. We're talking about being kind, generous to one another, giving gifts to one another in a lot of different forms. Where has that gone in our marriages today? To conclude our sermon for today and to conclude the service, um, we want to pray. Right now, I particularly want to pray for marriages. Marriages, for people who are watching by video. There's so many marriages in this country that if they haven't ended yet, they're going too soon if something isn't done. Marriages are upset by so many different things. I want to pray for marriages. And uh, so if you're in a relationship that's being upset and being challenged, Satan is coming in and beating up on husband and wife, and you seem to be going your different ways, you seem to be draw, growing apart, God can repair. God can restore. God can make things right. God can put the hearts of both husband and wife where they need to be. Where there is respect and love. And God can mend broken hearts. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Has people who are in a congregation to pray with us. And if you're in one of these marriages or you know someone who is, pray with us. Stretch your hand towards the screen, whatever you feel rightly to do. I'm going to stretch my hands to bless you and to bless your marriage. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you right now. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the guidance that your, your word gives us, Lord, Father. And right now, Father, we, we pray, Father, for the marriages, for this marriage, Father, that is being challenged, that is being upset, that Satan is coming in and begun to wreak havoc, Lord. Father, it's something that may have grown up very quickly or it may be something that has grown up very slowly over time. But Father, wherever it is right now, it is being challenged and upset. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will restore, that you'll bring back together. Lord, the couple that is hearing this prayer, the husband or the wife that's hearing this prayer, they may be, they may be having divorce papers in their hand or they may already be separated. They already may be apart. But Lord, if they haven't married someone else, if they haven't joined themselves with someone else, even though they're apart, Lord, You can bring them back together. You can restore. And Father, I pray right now for this marriage, Lord. Father, for the person that's watching and listening. Lord, I pray right now, Father, that You would just come alive in their heart. Father, I pray right now that Your hand of blessing would be upon the marriage and that both husband and wife Father, that their hearts would begin to draw closer to You and would begin to draw closer to each other, that the course would be changed. 
Father, I pray right now, Father, that uh, Lord, that you would begin to mend, that you would begin to heal this broken marriage. Father, that you would draw them back together. Lord, I rebuke the hand of Satan. I bind him in the name of Jesus and command that he take his hand off of the marriage. Father, I pray that, that you would allow both hearts to heal, to forgive. Father, we praise you and we give you thanks and glory and honor and praise. We ask these words in Jesus' name. If you're watching by video and you have any comments or questions or you'd like to write in, please do so. Spakes at spiritandtruth.net. We're genuinely concerned. If you live in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we invite you to come and be part of our service. God bless you.